Welcome back to the New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Taxes are paid where profit is made. We've got that story plus political change and subversion strategy. But first, Russia's mere payment cards to give Visa and MasterCard a run for their money. This via TASS fact box, basically a press release. Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a law stating all public sector workers and persons entitled to welfare benefits will switch over to domestically issued MIR payment cards from July 1st, 2018. Retirees will start using MIR cards from July 1st, 2020. MIR card insurance and servicing for Russian pensioners will be free of charge. Moreover, all cash dispensers and terminals operated by Russian banks will be required to accept MIR cards for payment from July 1st, 2017. All Russian businesses with transactions of over over 40 million rubles, 700,000 U.S. dollars a year, must start accepting mere payment cards before October 1st, 2017. The need to develop mere payment cards was prompted by U.S. sanctions imposed on Russia in the spring of 2014. Due to the sanctions, the world's two largest payment systems, Visa and MasterCard, blocked transactions with the cards of many of Russia's banks. And this article, which we will, of course, include a link to in the show notes, includes the list of those names, specifically of those banks, of those areas, and also Crimea Crimea, and, and beyond. James, this is going to slowly kick in, but I imagine the effects are going to be pretty massive. Perhaps. I mean, I guess we'll have to see the way that this unfolds, but it's certainly of a piece. It's just a uh, a small slice of a much larger pie that's being baked right now by Russia and China, really. And I wrote about this recently for the the uh, the subscriber newsletter where I wrote about uh, China and Russia creating alternate banking system. And this is one aspect of that. But there are many, many others um, to do with uh, China developing its own payment system, for example, to rival the SWIFT network and other stories like that. And in fact, we've been covering this. We covered this back in September 2014, where we talked about China and Russia's SWIFT alternative. I wrote an editorial about it back in March 2015. So this is a long-term developing story, and this is just one little piece of that story. But I think the uh, one thing to keep in mind about this story is that you're very right to point out the um, press release kind of nature of this. It's clearly coming from Russia and um, mouthpiece media, so it plays up the, uh, the 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 system and doesn't play down some of the downsides to the system. For example, um, if you read the fine print, you find out that for uh, this uh, this new uh, uh, payment network doesn't work from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Moscow time. So that, you know, kind of puts a significant damper on transactions. Uh, And it costs up to five cents per wire transfer, which is regarded expensive. Um, And you note that this uh, this new uh, system is uh, mandated to work with ATMs in the country in the coming months. Uh, But interestingly enough, uh, I noted that Beyond the Headlines had this story about a ATM virus that has recently taken hold in Russia, where um, basically it automatically dispenses large denomination bills when this virus uh, gets entered into a system and people enter the right code. So it's a way to hack into these ATMs. And uh, the virus does not have a file body, so it is not recognized by antivirus programs. It can therefore exist in the operating memory of an ATM for an unlimited time. It is the first time such a virus has been detected in Russia. So one has to wonder if there is some interesting financial uh, cyber uh, hacking or attacking going on right now from outside forces that are looking to undermine these types of payment systems. At any rate, uh, perhaps this is all smoke and mirrors, because when you look, for example, into the Chinese payment system that was meant to rival the SWIFT network, which does the interbank communications and and, uh, uh, gives the transaction data to banks that are trying to settle um, transactions internationally. Uh, China not only kind of watered down their payment system before they launched it, at this point now they have actually formally signed an agreement to use the SWIFT network to carry their transaction data. So the the entire idea of this originally, supposedly, well, we got to get around the SWIFT network because we saw what happened with Iran when they were delisted in 2012. We don't want that to happen to us, so we'll have to create our own alternative. That gets watered down and watered down and watered down to the point where it is literally now a subsidiary of the SWIFT network. So... I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors here and a lot of press releases that make things sound grander than they really are. 
Well, a lot of smoke and mirrors, and, I, and the virus story that you mentioned is is really interesting from the standpoint of what could be, you know, virtual terrorism. It could even be disguised as someone else acting as some other, someone else, some other nation, if you will, which perfectly sets us up into our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 309. This is being published on May 4th, 2017, as we go to the London Independent, owned by Russian oligarchs, German soldier posed as Syrian refugee in false flag terror plot. A cell of suspected white right-wing extremists operating within the German army are being investigated as, as the probe into an alleged terror plot widens. Prosecutors are investigating a group of up to five people surrounding a soldier accused of posing as a Syrian refugee to carry out a false flag attack. The suspect, named only as Franco A., was arrested after police traced a loaded gun he stashed at Vienna International Airport, but investigations at his barracks have revealed signs of a wider network. An assault rifle case carved with a swastika was found in his room where the letters HH, of course Heil Hitler, were inscribed on the wall and a Nazi era pamphlet depicting a Wehrmacht soldier was discovered. He didn't raise any alarm over extremism while in the army, despite writing a master's thesis on political change and subversion strategy at a French university in 2014 that was found to contain far-right thinking. Now, James, this story goes on and on and on, but I, I've got to imagine there's got to be a lot of these kind of stories that we don't know about or don't hear about. And it's only because this ties into some larger terror plot that I think it's probably getting traction. But I think it's pretty great that shows like ours and many others in some ways have forced mainstream media to openly address and use the term and even put it in the headline from the London Independent, German soldier posed a Syrian refugee in false flag terror plot. James? That's ex is exactly right. I've pointed that out before, that 10 years ago, people didn't even know what that term meant, and now they're using it in mainstream headlines. So that is a significant victory if this is a battle for people's minds. Now, this story, as you say, it goes on and on. It's really fascinating and somewhat horrifying to think about the uh, the ultimate implications of this but my mind immediately turns to Gladio B and I think this I think we have to see this in the bigger bigger picture of what's going on here we have obviously the whatever the NATO forces and all of their allies creating the original seed of this crisis by of course, bombing Syria to smithereens, for example, and funding the terrorist insurgency that's that's tearing that country apart and did, bombing Libya to smithereens and all of that that creates the, the crisis and the chaos and the tumult, which leads to all of this migration. And then they create the hysteria over the, oh, the refugees are coming. And so they whip up all these stories about, uh, oh, this and this and this and this. And half of them turn out to be false. But, you know, it's the headline that, that matters, not, uh, not the reality. And then... And then the other part of this, the fait accompli, is, oh, okay, and then we get soldiers to dress up or pretend to be refugees, get on the refugee system to, so they're accepting welfare, and then participate in false flag events so that we can blame them on those scary refugees, which, by the way, we created the whole crisis in the first place. It's problem, reaction, solution in every way. They're, they're manipulating it on every side to make people again fall into their paradigm where oh it's you know it's the it's the virtuous european west versus these muslim hordes that are invading that are actually german soldiers dressed up as muslims and all of this i mean it is it's flat out blatant in your face that they are controlling this and this is the way that Gladio B or its next iteration, whatever, is operating now. The original Gladio, obviously, they were dressing up as commies and whatever to do bombings so that they can demonize their political opposition. It's the same thing here. They're trying to stir up the clash of civilizations. That is the, the game plan. And I've talked about it before. Samuel P. Huntington and, other, and others have been writing about this for a very long time, and they've been salivating at the prospect of this because this is the next rung up the ladder of collectivization into regionalization towards global global government and they can't get you there until you, they get you into these false narratives and they're spinning them with stories like these. It's a fascinating story. I hope people will go and read the original. And there was a, uh, a one before this that I tweeted out earlier in the week that was the sort of the beginning of this story and this is the second part of the story. So we'll put both of those in the show notes so people can read up on it. But this is it. This is how Gladio works. And you, you've even got me thinking, I know it's, uh, it's on a kind of smaller level, but still 
pretty massive here in the States. You know, I'm, I'm here in Portland, Oregon, the home of the Trump riots. And of course, this last May Day, you see massive fights. And again, it's a perfect storm of who knows who's stirring up what for the benefit of some other some other entity, some other being. So again, it's getting people to kind of fall into these paradigms. And it's just I kind of watch it play out on my local news. It's just almost it's almost embarrassing, James. I suppose appropriately enough, we'll go from Russia to Germany to Austria for our third and final story this week. As Austria wants to tax tweeting, searching, and liking on the internet, we take this via Bloomberg, also owned by oligarchs. Yeah. Austria is seeking ways to make digital services like Alphabet Incorporated's Google or Facebook Inc. pay taxes for transactions with the nation's internet users, trying to plug gaps in a tax system still designed for brick-and-mortar businesses. The most ambitious part of the plan targets the business models of Twitter, Google, Facebook. The tacit pact under which searching, liking, posting, and tweeting remains free as long as users let the companies feed all that usage data into algorithms that help tailor advertising that's aimed at the most likely buyers. That arrangement is a form of bartering, and a value-added tax could be imposed on such transactions just as the levies are extended in other parts of the economy, said Andreas Scheider, the parliamentary head of Austria's Social Democrats. The business transaction that's going on here is that users are paying with their personal data, Scheider told journalists in Vienna. Quote, the business model of those Internet companies is based on massive revenues that are generated with the help of those data. We need a new approach to make sure that taxes are paid where revenue and profit is made. I, I, <laughs> this is one of the stories I don't really know what to think. You start to think that it is maybe a pushback. Maybe we don't want all of our personal information out there given, but all of these situations come back to the fact that we've all clicked. Yes, I agree. I've read the terms and agreements. I know you're going to give everything away. James, what do we do with this? Here's where my mind goes with this. This is another demonstration of the fact that the government believes it owns you. You, in totality, everything you do, everyone you interact with, the ways that you interact with them, everything about you, they believe they own. So that any transaction that you have with people that is valuable to you or to them or to both of you, they, they well, there's value there. There's a value exchange that's taking place. We can tax it. That's ultimately what this is about is, uh, of course, by that logic, of course, then barter and, and absolutely everything else is is just taxable. We just got to put a dollar value on it and then tax you for it. And that's the really disturbing part of this. And this is actually of a, of a piece with some of the other New World Next Week tweets that I made this week. Um, for example, the Indian Attorney General just argued before the, the Supreme Court of India, citizens do not have absolute right over their bodies. No, of course, you can't say what you do or don't do with your body. The government gets to determine and delimit and tell you what you can and cannot consent to with your body. They're arguing that in this case, in the context of that uh, biometric uh, ID system that I've been talking about in recent months that's about to be linked into the uh, cashless payment system, um, basically saying, no, you don't have the right to say that you will not give us your biometric ID details. The government can force you to do that and then lose, uh, you know, a couple million people's data in the process. But, you know, whatever. Um, but they are there that the government is explicitly in that case arguing we own your body. And of course, that's what, for example, the drug war, that's what it's about. It's the government saying we own your body. We can tell you what you do with your body or don't do with your body. And this is the same part, uh, same idea as a story I tweeted out. Hundreds suffer as city shuts down church for helping the homeless. You cannot do things like that unless we give you the proper go-ahead. And in this case, it's a zoning regulation. You're, well, you don't have zoning regulation to have a, a homeless shelter here, so you can't help the homeless here. We get to tell you what you can do, where you do it, and what you do with your body, or what you don't do with your body. We can tell you if you can consent or not consent to, to the things that we want to do with you. We can tax things that you do with other people. Even if there's no money to changing hands, there's value. Therefore, we'll put a dollar figure on it and tax it. So all of these stories are of a piece, and it all comes down to the central idea. The government believes it owns you. The only question is, are you going to go along with that? Do you agree with that? I think it's interesting the story you talk about with the church that's in Iowa, and I wonder if situations like that are going to cause 
other churches, organizations, you know, secular organizations and religious organizations to stop getting their government designation that says, oh, you have tax-free status, that they're not even going to apply for it anymore and to try and fly under the radar. That, I think, is a kind of huge way that we're winning, that even people that we wouldn't normally align ourselves with politically or socially or whatever, again, constructed divisions, when they all start to get to the same point of saying, I want to remove my consent and involvement with anything that has to do with the state, that's a positive thing. One of your other tweets was about MIT, that they've noted something about one in three kids in developing countries aren't documented. Their births aren't documented, James, and you noted, hey, that's a good start. And I actually included that on my latest Good News Next Week episode. Do you want to say anything about that? Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, that's, well, that story, the MIT story about undocumented kids kicks off my latest episode of Good News Next Week. As James, you and I started here back in 2015, we included on every New World Next Week episode some kind of good news. So I took that and made it a spinoff and make episodes of Good News Next Week. And this week's episode, Being in Nature Naturally Makes You Feel Better. Stop the presses. Going out in nature is actually good for your mind and body and soul. Also talk about a little bit of hemp health and the trash monster. And all of that is available on the episode of Good News Next Week. And James, I'll just close out by saying you and I make independent, non-commercial alternative work, and we can only continue to do that if people support our work on Patreon and beyond. Well, after an episode like this, I think people do need a dose of good news. So I hope they'll uh, switch over to your channel to watch that. All right, James, thank you for these three stories. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, buddy. Take care.